It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Dr. Lucille Burbank. Hi, Dr. Burbank. How are you? I am doing just fine, thank you. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. So, we're going to be talking about Sesame Street today, yeah? Yes, we are. What an exciting show. It's <laughs> over 50 years old. <laughs> it's still on? Uh, yes, it is. Um, it is formed a contract with HBO, so HBO is uh, creating new episodes of Sesame Street. Yes, it's on, but it also has all these great initiatives that um, are being aired, like on racism, foster care, uh, military families, all sorts of good sub uh, subject matter, autism. Um, so you can find it... Uh, all, all around, actually, you can subscribe to a newsletter, and they will show, they will tell you the upcoming uh, new segments or muppets. Okay, now I think when most people think of Sesame Street, it's synonymous with Jim Hansen, but he wasn't really the creator of the show, was he? No, no, no. Um, it's because the Muppets are such a big part of the show. Jim Henson is the creator of the puppets, which he coined Muppets. He named them Muppets. Uh, the two creators are Joan Cooney and Lloyd Morissette. And they were um, having dinner together and they got to talking and Joan was a um, documentary film producer at that time and Lloyd was ahead of the Carnegie corporation and they were very um, upset about what was happening on television and and especially children's television so um, they proposed this idea and Joan did the research and you have Sesame Street. What was children's television like in the late 60s? I mean I was a kid uh, when Sesame Street came out I was seven years old so I was almost a little bit too old for it already. But yeah, um, yeah. I don't remember watching anything that was particularly for kids. Saturday morning cartoons was what I watched. That's what I remember. Bugs Bunny and yeah. the Warner Brothers, all that. Yeah, um, it's so true. In fact, um, around the late 60s, um, and even um, before the late 60s, as Sesame Street was being planned, the uh, Peggy Sharon's um, Action for Children's Television came out. Peggy Sharon was very much involved in getting um, good quality children's programming um, up to the forefront. And then um, there was a lot of violence on television, uh, in fact, the Sergeant General produced a study on television violence, which was this thick paperback. And uh, everybody was worried about the status also uh, of television. Also, the civil rights movement was, was coming to the forefront. And, and of course, we have uh, Vietnam. But it was right. more the civil rights movement which also was instrumental in creating Sesame Street because these um, children in the city, inner cities, they needed some intervention in terms of preschool education so they wouldn't be behind in school. And so that was why um, Sesame Street was also developed. Well, as I remember, the early Sesame Streets concentrated on numbers, I remember that song ten nine eight seven six five four three two one, and uh, and then they would they would teach kids how to count, how to do basic math. They didn't get into big heavy social issues in those days, though, right? They didn't, and the reason why is they weren't sure how long they would last. So they really wanted to um, make sure that poverty children who could not afford to go to preschool 
were being educated. And so it was more cognitive material. Then as time went on and they were able to see, hey, you know, we can, we have a presence here and we'll be existing for a while, then let's add some effective material. And that's where you get into, um, they did death, for instance, that um, effective material when Mr. Hooper, the storekeeper on Sesame Street, he had been playing that for about 12 years, he died. And instead of telling the children, oh, we're going on vacation, he went on vacation or he's retired, they decided to to be honest with them and deal with the subject matter of death. Did you actually ever meet Jim Hansen? I mean, I know he died a long, like 30 uh, years ago. Well, so. I, I saw him. I didn't interview him because he was so involved in doing his work. I worked very closely with Carol Spinney, who was the puppeteer for uh, Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. And Carol Spinney was hired by Jim Henson and very close to um, Jim. And he said he loved to work 16, 18 hours a day. And somehow intuitively, I felt I would, because I was a doctoral student when I was doing these questions, and then I um, took the information out of my dissertation and put it in uh, some books. But I just felt, mm, I'm not going to involve him. Um, I'm going to do Jane Henson. And Jane Henson was his wife and creative partner. Was She was just fabulous. And I felt like that was a good balance. And in fact, um, pretty soon after I interviewed Jane Henson, Jim Henson died. He died very so young, I didn't was he? Kind yeah. of, I was kind of right on. Yeah, I, I remember he died... Uh, well, it's got to be 30 years May now, May right? 1990. So 31 years. I think it was May 16th or something. Yeah. Um, I thought it was 1990. Um, I'll have to look it up. But it was around that time. And um, so I was, and I had spoken to Jane, Jane after Jim Henson had died. I didn't mention too much. She just got back to me on some questions that um, she couldn't answer or wanted to just be thorough about. So I, I didn't really say too much, except that I was sorry. I saw Jim Hansen on a couple of interviews that he did with Johnny Carson on the uh, Tonight Show, and he brought Kermit the Frog, and he brought, I forget, one of the other characters with him. But to see him sit there in the chair next to Johnny, manipulating the puppet and doing the voices, was absolutely astonishing because even though you know you knew it was him the voice and the way he could manipulate the puppets were so real that even though the camera shot was on both of them you actually thought it was two people <laughs> it was really incredible. you did, you did. Yeah. and i've seen it too yeah and then there's also on youtube this wonderful um kind of documentary or it's a long video um about Jim Henson, and you would see him doing that, and it was astounding. Yeah. And he would explain, you know, I'm not going to hide or anything. I'm just going to sit here, and you will be able to divide us, separate us. And and yes, you did. It was it was charming and so talented. He's so talented. What a genius. Well, and what was really great about it is I've you know you've all seen good ventriloquists, but ventriloquists have to make that concerted effort not to move their mouth when the the dummy is talking, right? And they have to try to keep, right. keep their facial muscles very still and tense and all of that. Jim didn't do any of that. He he was as animated. No, he just threw it out. He just he, threw it he out. He didn't believe yeah. in that. Yeah. 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 He really didn't believe in that. He said, um, and that was his take, his style on doing it, and he just felt like it wasn't necessary at all. Oh, it wasn't. And he was no. right. Yeah. That was part of his genius, was that he could so successfully convince people that this was two different people while he was, his mouth was moving, his face was moving, and you could, you would just, your eyes would naturally go to either him or to the Muppet. 
It, right. It was, it was beautiful. I know. I watched those two. And then this lovely, uh, if you want to look it up on YouTube, they have this lovely long video after he died talking about it. And they show that again and again and again. Oh, I'm going to look for that. It adds yeah. some other info, information. But it is it is beautiful, yes. yes. And he loved his work. Absolutely loved it. He said he would rather, you know, not go on vacations. He would rather just work all the time. Well, you could see the passion in him. Absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Your book is called The Inside Secrets of Sesame Street. When I first saw the title, I must admit that I thought it was a scandal type thing. Like there were some dirty oh. secrets about Sesame Street. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, oh, I thought about that when I did the title. It's a good comment. But I really wanted to show why Sesame Street was so successful and what makes up a good children's television series because we don't. We had some. We had Captain Kangaroo. We had Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Right. And then there was Sesame Street. So that was the whole uh, reason for the book because I was able because I was, I, I was a consultant at Sesame Street, and I was also getting my doctorate in educational media. And so my dissertation was interviewing these creators, or what I would call pioneers of Sesame Street, the, the ones who created the show, and I could talk, and they loved to talk, and I was listening and listening and listening. So getting all that in-depth information, I really, you know, wanted to get it out there. You did your dissertation on Sesame Street? I did. I, oh, how fun. <laughs> I did. Yeah, well, it was really great. I did my dissertation at Temple University, and they kind of let you, at least my advisors, let me do what I wanted. So I received a scholarship, and I not only interviewed all the creators, you know, the writers, the musicians, the researchers, the puppeteers, the producers and directors of Sesame Street, but also I interviewed Fred Rogers and his staff and then Bob Keeshan with Captain Kangaroo and his staff. Wow. So I, I just had a ball listening. <laughs> That's amazing. That's going to be the, the most fun topic of a dissertation I think I've ever heard. Yeah, it really was, and I am just so thankful they, I did, um, it wasn't quantitative evaluation, it was more qualitative. So that's why the rich interviews and I could describe and I could write a book because that's more characteristic of qualitative research. And they just let me, and that was new, kind of coming out on its own at the time, and they just let me go ahead, and I am so grateful. <laughs> well, that's great. We've got just a couple of minutes left, but I want to hit on one of your talking points that's on your bio. It says, what parents need to know about television and digital media? Oh, yeah. They, they, need, to, they need to do a couple of things, of course, with that, because um, the Internet is like the Wild West out there. Yeah, it sure and is. And they need to protect their children. It really is the Wild West. And so they need to... Be sure to limit screen time and not give their children access to the iPhone all the time. No media should be in the bedrooms. Absolutely none because you can get in so much trouble if there isn't some adult supervision. Uh, they also need to, and it's a very easy thing, to read aloud to their children. Even though their children can read, it would be, it's really fun as a bonding experience and you increase vocabulary and you just go there and you have such fun discussing books. So reading aloud is good. Limiting the time being uh, on um, media, being very selective. Um, I'm a big proponent of turning on the TV and turning it off. Uh, no leaving the TV on. Um, continually at all because then you have exposure to all these other images and um, sex and sexual um, stereotypes and 
so forth and violence if you just leave the TV going on. So what you do with the child is you select a program and they learn. Um, you have to start young with this. And, of course, you're your child's. The parents are their child's first teacher. So what the parents do, the children will do. So you teach them to select a program, you watch it with them, or they watch it, and then you turn it off. And perhaps at dinner time, I'm a big, big fan of getting together at dinner time and discussing, you know, the child's problems, what they're doing, what they're dealing with, social media, you know, depending on the age, also what they're watching, especially as children get older. You have to be very, you have to know what they're watching and discuss it and be up on that. So having those dinner time discussions and sharing is, is very big. So it's three things, limiting the screen time, uh, reading aloud, and then having those wonderful family discussions at dinner and laughing together. Well, I agree with you. I don't know how many times I've seen this, but when I've been out out and about shopping or doing my errands, I see a parent pushing a baby in a stroller. The baby in the stroller has, well, it's like a toddler, maybe not quite an infant, but in the stroller with an iPhone, and the parent is pushing the stroller with another iPhone in, in their hand. I know. It's awful. It's awful. And I see, see it all the, the time. Problem we're, yeah. yeah, the problem we're having here is that we need media literacy because there's a plethora of media out there. And, P, and parents need to know that media is not an end in itself. It's only a means to an end. It's a means to inspiring the child, to educating the child to exchanging information with one another. It's just a tool. And so um, really, and there are courses and workshops, but I would encourage parents to really just take these courses and learn how to use the media as productively as possible. Um, it's just because it's accessible, they don't know it, and they just do what you just said they do. Well, it's become, uh, you know, an electronic babysitter, essentially. Oh, I know. Yeah. And, and, and that's like TV being a babysitter. Right. And it's the same principle. Um, you know, TV shouldn't be a babysitter, neither should any other um, media be. Those laptops or iPhones especially, I would, um, I have a granddaughter, she's 13 years old, she, my son does not give her any access to iPhones at all. And uh, it's very limited. And really, a child, I, I don't care if they're 16, 17, they shouldn't have an iPhone for more than an hour at a time because there's too much out there. I mean, yeah. kids are Googling all sorts of things that they shouldn't be seeing. Uh, Dr. Burbank, yeah. we have to wrap this up. We are out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out, a personal one or one for the book? Well, I think right now, because my website is under construction, um, you can get the book on Amazon. Okay. And it's, um, yeah, so the inside secrets of Sesame Street, and really it's all legit. What you're really reading about are all the behind-the-scenes fun stuff that happened during the show to, and also created, you know, the show to be such a wild success and, you know, that you loved it. Everybody loved it. It's kind of nostalgia and that's such joy. Well, thank you for coming on this show and talking. This was a lot of fun. And yeah, best of luck with the book. I oh, hope it does well. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I had such fun too. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. 
DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Tony Tedeschi. Hey, Tony, how are you? I'm good, Douglas. Yourself? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So, you've got a book out called Unfinished Business. Uh, Is this your first book, or have you written many? Uh, I've written a couple of others. Um, this, This is my first novel. I've written two business books. I ghosted a couple of other business books, and I ghosted a couple of uh, detective novels years ago. Okay. Now, when you say ghosted, just for people who don't know what that is, you write the book, but you write it under someone else's name? Correct. Um, There's a real person involved who has, uh, you know, a story that can basically, you know, sort of weave its way through a novel, but really isn't a writer, so... You ghost the book for that person, you know, working in collaboration with them. I had a unique experience, though. I, I ghosted for a ghost. <laughs> I, I mean, I worked with uh, Donald Bain, who was probably the world's most prolific ghost writer. Don died a few years ago. But he um, he ghosted all the Margaret Truman um, murder mysteries, and he, oh. he wrote the 20, 43 books that spun off from the Murder, She Wrote TV show. Um, but Don, Don was so, you know, uh, in, in such demand as a ghostwriter, he would have to turn away uh, projects. And he he, turn, he he just farmed out a couple of me, so I got to work with him. I learned a lot about plot, characters, pacing, that sort of thing. So I guess I got the disease. <laughs> so how does the ghost person get paid then, if their name's not on it? Oh, uh, you work out a contract. And, oh, I mean, part of it. Okay. You know, part of the contract is you can't tell, <laughs> you can't say who you know, you know that you've had any involvement with the book. Oh, I see. Okay. Also says that you learned to play the guitar. Mm-hmm. How long ago was that? <laughs> I, I'm. I mean, um, I'll be eighty next month. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't. I would never have guessed. But, well, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, people keep telling me that, but I I know what the face in the mirror looks like. But uh, I uh, I had an early rock and roll band right in the late fifties, and oh, okay. um, I mean we did covers, you know, mostly. And uh, yeah, but then I you know went off to college. I got drafted by the army, uh, took a commission in the air force, and the guitar playing sort of went away. Uh, and then twenty years ago, um, I had uh, I, I got back into it and. Um, Started, started writing songs. Uh, I got to the point where um, I, uh, I was hosting open mics here in Glen Cove, Long Island, where I live. And we have um, three wonderful recording studios here in Glen Cove. Um, got to know um, the, uh, the, the, the owner, producer, engineer on one of them. And we worked together. We actually, I actually wrote a complete musical play a couple of years ago. Uh, called Leaving Pleasantville, um, which is about the period from 1955 when um, 
rock and roll, uh, rock around the clock hit the top of the charts through 1970, you know, when, you know, uh, rock and roll was so well established. I mean, the British bands had come and all of that right. stuff. And um, it was a, an amazing period, but... But but you know when you when you don't have any connections on Broadway or whatever, your your play just kind of sits there. <laughs> well, it was a great time for music. I think from 1955 to 1970s to the late 70s, for me, I think music sort of took its first step off the cliff uh, around 1982 when MTV came along, because yeah. you yeah. know it changed the whole priority of the music and it went from the audio to the video and yeah. and once the image of the band was more important than the actual music that they were creating the music took a back seat and it just uh, <laughs> it went from the back seat to the trunk to out of the car altogether <laughs> you know and you and I are totally on the same page with yeah, that <laughs> yeah well i'm i'm not 80 i'm not 80 years old but i'm uh, certainly not 20 i'll be uh 60 next year so well incidentally oh, yeah. i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off Douglas. no go ahead go ahead what were you gonna um say? that 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 period that i write about um uh i was um co-editor of the nyu newspaper in greenwich village um in uh, from 1963 to 1964, and that that was an incredible period. I mean, Woody Allen was doing stand-up comedy. Uh, Bob Dylan just started to play oh, the, yeah. the coffee houses. Yeah. Uh, the beat poets were, uh, you know, on the rise. Progressive jazz movement was going on. Um, what what happened was, you know, when I got back to writing songs, um, I, I just sort of my mind went back to that period, and um, you know, you had the freedom rides. Uh, 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 you know, going on uh, to, to the south, and what 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 the music in my play does is reflect that period, but in the genres of the time, you know, folk music, rock and roll, you right. know, you know, the British invasion. You had mentioned um, Woody Allen was doing stand up. Lenny Bruce was doing stand up at that point too. That that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never got to see Lenny Bruce though. I saw I saw uh, Woody Allen once. <laughs> Oh, and we wrote about that. Well, we, we, we started a special magazine supplement in our school newspaper, and, and we wrote about it. And since, you know, our, the students at NYU were a principal audience for, you know, those different uh, venues, uh, we got into all of them. I, got, I, I graduated at NYU. I was 23, 1A with the Army, and got drafted. I mean, I'm probably one of the few people in America who never wanted to graduate college. <laughs> You said you got drafted. That was before the lottery was going on. Yeah, it was. It was just before. I mean, you, you know, we you got a you got a student deferment for until your class graduated, and then and you automatically won a. I got drafted by the army, um, uh, recruited by the air force, and um, I mean, basically, you know, the army gave me a, a, a extension, um, but basically said if you're not in the air force in in January, you're in the army in February. <laughs> So what were you doing in the Air Force? Did you fly? No, I, um, um, I, I'd I spent my first year and a half in college as an engineering student at MIT, and the, rec the recruiter for the Air Force kept, I kept wanting to get into so, sort of public information so I could use you know, my, my writing credentials, but the recruiter kept mumbling something like, hmm, a year and a half at MIT, I ended up in... Uh, aircraft maintenance on a base uh, in New Mexico. We, ch we trained, uh, fight we trained fighter pilots in combat tactics for the war. I mean, we got uh, students right out of uh, flight school. We trained them for six months in combat, and uh, they went right to war in Vietnam. We, um, uh, my, my job was on the flight line, though. I was eventually chief of maintenance for, for the base. Oh, uh, I'm okay. sorry, uh, chief of quality control. You're reminding me of that movie, Full Metal Jacket, where uh, Matthew Modine's character Joker ends up, because he was a journalism student, and he ends up mm -hmm. being a writer for Stars and Stripes, and he gets sent over. Do you, yeah. Did you see that movie? A long, long time ago. 
Yeah, it it was you know uh, there, there was upside to everything you know I mean um, I met my wife uh, now my wife of almost fifty seven years two of my daughters were born in the barracks hospital on the base and um, you know, what I what I got to know about air you know airplanes really stood me well uh, after I got out of service I worked for eight years for American Airlines uh, you know writing in their PR department oh, wow. the, the engines we the engines we had in the F one hundred fighters were the same engines used in the uh, 707s of course modified for commercial use but right. it was great well let's talk a little bit about your book let's hit on your book your book's called unfinished business uh tell us about the mm -hmm. book what's it about it's it's a um i mean it, it's a mystery it's a thriller uh, i i um uh, I, I a little background on that i um um I spent, I've spent the better part of my career as a freelance journalist, and I've done a lot of, I did a significant amount of business writing uh, as, a, as a journalist. I wrote two business books, um, ghosted a couple of others for CEOs, and uh, I also traveled, I did a lot of travel writing, uh, which, which put me in places, many places around the world. I spent 13 years as writing all the special travel inserts for the magazine of the National Audubon Society. And uh, what, happen what happens is, you know, obviously you, uh, you know, you write a lot of journals. And, uh, you know, in, the, in, 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 in doing my reporting, of course, uh, you know, I had to stick to journalistic principles. But uh, to go back to, into my journals from time to time and uh, um, start thinking about, you know, uh, yeah, but what if? I mean, here's what really happened. <laughs> You know, but what if it were just slightly different? And, um, I, you know, that started to sort of morph into a project. I began the, writing on this book 20 years ago and, uh, and, you know, just kept getting back to it, you know, between writing gigs. And uh, like, for example, when I was in uh, when I was writing for Audubon, I spent a lot of time in Central America because the birding down there is amazing. Uh -huh. And um, uh -huh. Uh, you know, Costa Rica, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and you could you could see you know you know if you visit there frequently you could see you know what was happening to the rainforest and what development meant and what looking for natural resources meant and um, I, you know you saw how you know business was in command of a lot of the decisions that were made in that regard and um, you know I started looking into that and thinking yeah but what if, you know what if what if Something. What, what if there were barriers to what you know people in business needed to get done, and what would happen? And this this thriller began to materialize over the course of all those years. <laughs> you're you're clearly I'm in for the long haul on this stuff. <laughs> so you want to give us just a quick synopsis? I mean, don't give away the whole story, but just uh, touch on the characters and what goes on a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, the. Uh, um, Let's, let's say this. Uh, one of the things in, in working in business, uh, and mostly I've worked for some of the best people in business, but, but every now and then you work for some people who are, let's just say, not among the best. And uh, you know, when they make decisions that are hurtful to people, you know, invariably uh, the excuse is, well, you know, it's only business. It was, it was just business, you know. And that, that's, that started to sort of, you know, intrigue me, you know. Well, what happens if, some it's only business decision, uh, you know, impacts a number of people very badly. When those kind of decisions are made and the results are apparent, like for for example, people get laid off, you know, right. or a company goes bankrupt or whatever. Yeah, I mean that's pretty obvious. But what would happen if some decisions were made and then got layered, you know? Uh, over and over and over again over the course of time, and it, it's forgotten. Uh, I mean, the effects of that of that cause are sort of lost, and that's what happens in my book. I mean, people get you know um, uh, affected badly by a it was only business decision, and uh, you know uh, what what happens is the people who are affected badly start wanting to take their revenge. Ah, okay. Well, that sounds interesting. Okay, but in the process, in the process, let me just say this. I, you know, having been involved in business a lot, um, I, I, I was weaving into the plot line here. You know, not, not, a, you know, 
I was weaving into the plot line things that, uh, that, that drove the narrative. For, for example, a, a computer hack that really shuts down the supply chain, um, you know, and how much the world is dependent on that supply chain, especially now. And then, you know, in order to get, uh, you know, things to go of certain person's way, they manipulate stock sales. Uh, there's money laundering through Caribbean banks. And for, for eight years, they helped do PR uh, for, for uh, resorts in the Caribbean. So I know how that went. Um, and then you have the whole situation of women trying to break through the glass ceiling. All of that uh, is embodied in characters in the book and how they, they are on the upside or downside of, of what happens as the plot progresses. Well, you're right about the, uh, the computer hacks. I mean, that's going on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what's more interesting now uh, to me is how people, you even hear the term now, supply chain, much right. more often than you ever would have. And you realize how dependent the world is on, on the supply chain, you know? And if something gets disrupted, you know, in China or, uh, um, you know, South America or Europe or whatever, it can screw up the supply chain, you know, down the line. Well, suppose somebody can manipulate that, and which we're seeing now. I mean, you're seeing these ransomware attacks. Right. You know. Right. Well, there was the one on you know, the on pipeline the uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Colonial mm -hmm. Pipeline, and then the one that was just the other day, I think yesterday, was the meat packing one or the meat distributor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and they're thinking that it came from the same place <laughs> that it, you know, or yeah. from the same organization, some Russian hack, uh I wouldn't call him a company, but uh I'm sure it's more than one guy. If it's one guy, yeah. that's really bad. Yeah, well, the New York Times had a had a headline, a business headline yesterday which read how the world ran out of everything. <laughs> so, what what happened with me was, you know, when when you I knew I was writing something unusual with a business plot, okay? So I knew in the, in the process of doing that, you would have to explain things about business, you know, which could bore a reader to tears, especially somebody who was looking for a mystery or a thriller. Right. So the real challenge for me was to work this whole, these, these, these different, you know, business light motifs into the plot. And um, that took a lot of a lot of work, a lot of doing. But I I, I feel I've done it successfully. But if I don't think so, who would? <laughs> well, I guess there's only one way to find out. People are going to have to buy the book and read it. Yeah, that that would be very nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long has the book been out? Uh, we it was published on uh, on Amazon in uh, December. Um, God, I've got so many, uh, so many tales to tell you about my career. Well, I told you how old I am. But um, I, I, I've uh, known and learned to respect a number of writers over the years, and we've kept in touch with each other. Uh, about two and a half years ago, we started a cultural quarterly magazine called a Natural Traveler Magazine. And uh, these, these guys have guys and gals have been writing for it. And um, in the process of doing my book, we created a, a, a publishing imprint called Natural Traveler Books. And um, my novel is the first uh, is, is the first entry in you know our imprint. And uh, I've got four more in the pipeline, because I, I don't want that to be a vanity site. And um, you know, we, uh, we have a direct connection with, with Amazon. You know, that's how the whole process sort of came about. Uh, have you gotten any good reviews on it yet? I have, yes. Um, Kirkus Reviews uh, gave, gave us a really, really good review. It's, um, it's on the site. One of the things that thrilled me about their review was they called it very Raymond Chandler-esque. <laughs> oh. And, and he, was, he was one of my favorite writers. Well, Tony, we do have to wrap this up. Unfortunately, we are run out of time. Do you have a website that you want to give out, a personal website or one for the book? Sure. Um, as I said, the, the, the book, the website is naturaltravelerbooks.com, ex spelled exactly how, how I'm saying it, all one word, Natural Traveler Books. Um, you click on the website, you'll see a link to, you'll see some uh, write-up about the book, about the reviews, and it provides a, a link to Amazon. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. Uh, best of luck with the book. I hope it does very well. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thanks, Sam.